Thank you so much for tuning in for the more uh, research or, or in-depth look at this past quarter's um, events. My name is Benoit Paliquet. I'm the founder and one of the portfolio managers here at Exponent Investment Management. So let's get started and talk about the supporting charts for our previous video. One of the concepts we always look at, we usually look at it once a year, but let's look at it now right now. So we have uh, the multiple expansion, which is really what investors are willing to pay for for a dollar of earnings of, of um, on the index, if you will. So we have here a total return here, negative um, for the TSX and, and slightly negative as well um, for in, in US dollar terms for the S&P 500. So you can see that basically what we're looking for here is sometimes the, the return is, <clears throat> excuse me, driven by the ERP EPS growth. And sometimes the blue, the blue line is an, a multiple expansion. So you can see in 2018 that the multiple expansion was quite large. Um, the dividends is a small line. So what, what I'm trying, my point here is that we have in the US a massive multiple expansion going on, much larger than the earnings expansion or growth, if you will, because typically these two boxes are more or less the same size. Here in Canada, we see, in fact, that the multiple expansion was actually contracted if you compare it to 2018. So really the earnings carried the day here and obviously they were negative, so we had a negative number. The other point that I made in the shorter video is the concept of concentration. So here we have the S&P 500, the top 10 stocks as of the time of this writing, which was um, July 9th. So what we have here is the negative return of the S&P 500 since the beginning of the, of the year. And it's minus 4% as illustrated. But the top 10 stocks are actually up 26%. So that's a differential of 30%. I actually don't remember seeing that ever, where the top 10 stocks carry by such an extent. And you can see that there's always a slight, and it makes sense, intuitively it makes sense, the top 10 stocks will be, the, they're, they're the largest stocks because they're doing well. But this differential, this delta, I have never seen that before. And so it's fascinating to watch as we move forward. So who are those 10 stocks? We have Apple. Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, which has two named two rankings. We've combined them. Facebook, Berkshire Hathaway, Visa, Johnson Johnson, Walmart, and Procter and Gamble. And so the top stocks are all technology stocks. Sorry, the top five, as we know already from the previous video. So the concept of concentration is one thing, but the fact that the concentrated those concentrated names have carried the index so far is really what's important to remember here. So let's talk about good news baked in. Let's talk about, let's have a look at those technology names. So here we have Amazon, and this is just a model that Bloomberg has. You know, it doesn't mean that it comes from Bloomberg, it's always true, but it works pretty well. So the idea is to give you an idea, it's like a temperature gauge of where the valuations sit. And so what you do is if you look at the, if we're looking right now at the price earnings ratio, historically it is 48.8, let's call it 50 times. And that's that orange line right here. Right now we are sitting at 70 times earnings, which is basically three standard deviations above the mean in terms of valuation. And stocks do trade down below or you know, one standard deviation is around here. Ideally here at Exponent, you try to buy these things here and sell them you know, when they get one standard, maybe one, maybe two times standard deviations above. But this is fascinating to watch. So according to this model, Amazon's worth about $2,000, um, currently trading uh, over $3,000. So as we say, is the news baked in? Amazon's a great company, great stock, solves a problem that we've all had, certainly in this pandemic, retail, um, one would argue that it continued um, to keep parts of the economy turning over, if you will. Um, however, at what price? So here we have Apple, another great company. I mean, we some 
investors still own it. But the question is, would you buy it here today? The PE ratio is 26 times. The mean, the historical average is 17 and a half times. And we're again, three standard deviations above uh, his history here. So if you bought Apple at 240, 250, even $260, that was you know basically the fair price. So two things need to happen. Either they come back to the average in terms of valuation, or B, the earnings catch up, if you will, with the, the metric. It remains to be seen how much demand there will be. And if you're looking at Apple News, they're actually lowering prices on, on handsets. So it'll be interesting to see what, which one of the two out, possible outcomes, the stock fades back to its historical average or B, the earnings work themselves into the high valuation multiple. Fear factor. This, you know, a quarter ago, a lot of fear in the market, a lot of fear in the general population, and a lot of it is driven by the unknowns. So it's important to know that as the science evolves around the pandemic, there's a lot of change. So the initial models were, you know, very draconian in terms of the number of expected deaths all over the world. Um, the infection values certainly are high and even higher than this, the, the, what this um, headline highlights. We put it up there because just to illustrate that it moves all over the place. Um, but we are starting to realize that these earlier models around the death rates were probably over, over playing the uh, death or the death rates, if you will. And, um, and really there's, especially in the US and in some countries, each state is reacting differently to uh, this news. So earlier in the video, in the other video, I said that the pandemic has become a pol a politicized, if you will, and that's just the the what we're trying to illustrate here. So it, be it starts off with science. Science changes. There's new information, and then there's political reaction to what's going on. And so it's important to remember that from an investment's perspective that we need to, as investors, you, you need to you know, question the science um, and continue to understand how these projections are adapted and, and they're just projections. And to respect the fact they're just projections, understand that the science will change, there's always new data, and understand as an investor that you need to park your political um, aspirations or your political um, leanings uh, in the parking lot or in the car, if you will, when it comes to investing, because politics and investing do not um, make for good friends. So let's talk about the unemployment. It's it's kind of, especially in the US, it's all over the map. We were up at 18% back in April, 19% even. There's some studies that show that the unemployment rate is closer to 25% if you factor in um, the way the calculations are made. It's it's undeniable that the, the claims are down um, as it, an economy reopens. The real question here, and it's not being highlighted in the, in the headlines, which is what will employment look like post COVID? Which companies will reopen and come back? And which companies are, learn, are learning to operate efficiently with less? If you remember going into this crisis, there was a shortage of qualified workers. And so many companies would keep on extra staff just in case. Post COVID, clearly that won't happen. So you can expect, we expect anyway, that unemployment numbers once the, re, the economy reopens will take a long, long time before they get, we see the unemployment numbers prints that we saw say in January or February. So pre COVID. So here's another chart that we feel is very important is, is following the money. Where's the money going in terms of the different sectors? It gives you a pretty good indication or explanation why certain sectors are going up, even though the news flow or the narrative is quite negative. So let's look at an example here of um, the S&P 500. It's got negative flows. And what's going up is in terms of flows are the technology names, which up are up hard and oddly enough energy names so those are the two big players in terms of that are attracting money in the us 
to the detriment of the broad indices, so the S&P 500. Um, if we look over in Canada, we're looking at um, the consumer side um, and the gold side is really uh, attracting a lot of, of money uh, and the technology side. So clearly you've got um, a slightly different story where the broad indices are act attracting money, but there is, you know, the attraction is, is broadly diversified. Whereas in the U.S., really, there's only one player or two player really in, in energy and gold. So let's look at these charts for a minute here. We've got the S&P 500 here. We're basically, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, about 10%, if you will, from the high. Um, and we are well above the previous lows that we've had in the past two years, going back to 2018. In, Can in, um, in Canada, down here, we are still, you know, hovering or below the previous lows of 2017 and 2018. So that why am I bringing that up is basically if you're looking at your portfolio, especially if you're focused solely in Canada and wondering and reading the news about the U.S., how the market is hot and you're not participating, probably because you're focused in Canada uh, and not broadly diversified. Because, again, what's carrying the U.S. market is the technology exposure. If we go over to Europe, sort of similar story. We've got, uh, we're still well off the highs of um, 2018 around here and the levels, you know, we're still 20, 25% below the highs. And we had, we're basically going back to 2016 levels. The emerging markets, again, off the highs, um, similar story. We're still well below the previous highs as well, uh, and but had a nice bounce back. So again, we're probably going back to 2017 levels in terms of, of uh, valuation. So if we look at our earnings multiple, this is Canada on this side, and this is the US on the right, uh, on the left side, I should say. So from a valuation perspective, we're kind of in the middle. We can see that the earnings are, are have bottomed. The multiples, the B ratio is, is high, but obviously because the earnings, investors are looking to this turn. If you remember, markets turn and move up when the economic news turns less bad. It's still pretty bad. So as an investor, if you're waiting for the all clear signal, you're going to wait a long time because by the time um, the all clear signals off, the markets are off and running, investors are worried about something else. In the U.S., it's a different story. Um, the valuations are quite high. I will come back to that. The valuations are skewed to the upside, as is the performance because of the technology name. If you go out of the technology, we're finding some great names at historical valuations and depressed earnings. Um, so it's actually quite we're actually restraining ourselves not to deploy all of the capital of late simply because there's a lot of great names selling for cheap prices at earnings that are depressed because of the pandemic, but will bounce back. So let's talk about that a little bit. So there are some sales when you're talking about depressed earnings. Why do we care about this? Well, if you stop and think about it, if a restaurant or a cruise line does not loses a sale this winter or this week, Let's just say you don't go to the restaurant this week because you don't feel safe. You're not going to go twice next week or twice three months from now when you do feel safe. So those, those sales are lost forever. Other sectors of the economy, let's just say medical devices. If you've got a bad hip and you don't want, and, and your surgery has been uh, postponed or even canceled until further notice because of COVID, you still have that bad hip. So the, company that manufactures the hip or the all of the equipment or even the hospital that will provide the service in the U.S. Um, are seeing their sales down. But these a lot of these sales are simply deferred because that bad hip will get need to get replaced. It won't, it's not getting any better with time. So uh, another example would be Disney. Why isn't Disney selling for $50, $50 where it's trading for one to $115 or $120? When, when you stop and think about it, the parks are, are lost uh, or, or closed or about to reopen at, at a much smaller capacity. Um, there's no live sports, although that's coming back. And there's no there are no movies really being shot or being distributed. 
Well, the movies are being deferred. So those that are in production will simply be deferred. The parks, if you are planning a, plan, a, a Disney trip, well, you will go to Disney. You're just going to go next year. So a lot of businesses have deferred sales versus um, completely lost sales. So from from a valuation perspective, when we're looking for stocks, we're, we're, we're trying to make a, a discern the difference or, or find the difference between lost sales and postponed sales. So I got an email from a client this week and I got accused of being a yesterday's man, effectively investing in yesterday's technology. And I've been called many things, but I'm only 46 years old. So being called yesterday's man at 46 was, was a tough one for me. So here we have, as an example, Tesla. So we see here Tesla as of the time of the recording, I mean, it took a snapshot here and on uh, July 6th, call it $1,400. It's actually up 40% in a month. So most of July, the stock is up 40%. So what does that mean? Right now, the Tesla stock is trading for $254 billion in market cap. Sales expected to be $27 billion and $30 billion, or call it $40 billion in 2020, 2021, sorry, and about $3 billion in cash flow, which translates into 300, the number of units expected are 367 million units. And the following year, five half a million units. Compared to for the same 250 billion, I can show you Honda and Toyota. As of the time of this recording, you buy them for $252 billion. But $350 billion in sales, so over 10 times, and 10 times the cash flow. And many times the number of units. In fact, a, a funny story, all that you need to do is divide your market cap, 254 billion, by the number of units sold. And I'll tell you how much investors are willing to pay for, for each dollar or for each Tesla being sold. When you run that math, it will blow your mind. You will understand why, as Tesla is a great of a company, and one would argue Elon Musk is a visionary, no argument here. From a valuation perspective, as an investor, are you going to lay down your dollars for Tesla or are you going to buy Toyota or Honda? We prefer, well, we don't own any of them, but that's really, we would buy certainly Honda, maybe even Toyota at the right price. The idea here though, oh, and there's $7.4 billion in dividends paid by those two companies in the last fiscal year. In Canada, same example. It's actually more dramatic. We have Shopify. Whoop, let me get this. So we Shopify for a market cap of 160 billion Canadian, sales of call it 3 billion Canadian, and 70 million in cash flow. That's 70 million. For the same 150, 160 billion, we could sell you National Bank, all of it, Loblaws, all of it, CNR, all of it, Synovus, and Power Corp. Shopify's management has done some fantastic things. What they have done is brilliant. I wish I could do that with Exponent. I wish I could do 10% of that with Exponent. But the fact of the matter is from an investment perspective, what is the value in Shopify? A lot of good news is baked in. We can argue that National Bank is not gonna grow very much. We can argue that Loblaws, CNR, and Synovus and PowerCorp won't argue very much. No argument here. But what's baked in? So great companies can make for some really crummy investment, just as just as middle of the road companies at the right price can make some really great investments. So let me restate that: great companies can make some poor investments, can make a it can make for a poor stock purchase. Whereas middle of the road, not top shelf companies can make great investments if you get them at the right price. So let's look at the rest of the charts here quickly. We've got um, the VIX. So it's still around 30. It, piked around, it spiked around 80. As I said in the earlier video, when you're around 30, it's considered elevated. So it's fascinating to watch that on one hand, the VIX is high. So that's the expectation of volatility 
on the part of investors. But on the other hand, we've got high markets. Usually you get a spike in volatility and lower markets. In this case, we're not seeing it. So back in December of 2018, the market sold off 19% and the VIX spiked. Again, we had a, a, a sell-off in early 2018 and a spike in VIX. So here, what's interesting is we have still elevated VIX, but high markets. Usually you have high VIX, low markets. Uh, if we move over here in terms of Canadian currency, we're really looking at 75 cents. We faded off of that, but really that was a flight to safety. We're back to the 75 cents. Uh, so if you're traveling, uh, you know, you want to sell your U.S. dollars down here and you want to buy your U.S. dollars when you get close to 80 cents. That's kind of the historical average in terms of the loonie. Um, if we're looking at oil price down here, we're still off the lows of 2018 of $80. Although we have oil and gas exposure, we're not calling for $140. Again, all that we were trying to, to get exposure is scenario number one of our earlier video, which is the economy turns around, the demand picks up for oil, and the supply side of the equation has been curtailed because of the pandemic. And so you could see a bounce back for a short while of the oil price. 30 or $40, really $50 would be my guess in terms of a normal oil price uh, in terms of where uh, marginal suppliers are making some money uh, at these demand levels. And here we have uh, the gold price. Putting this up, this is kind of the new thing. Um, going back, you could go back to 2013, the oil price was sort of between 1400 and 1100 going back to 2013. It clearly has broken through. Um, usually you get it sort of bounce back and you get a fade. We are, some portfolios already own old gold. We may even add more to it, who knows? Uh, but it's clearly um, investors are worried about inflation and so gold prices tend to go up in that environment. Let's look at bonds and the bond, the bond yield, uh, the bond curve. So as I said in the earlier video, we the this line right here is where things, uh, where yields were a year ago. So we had a negative yield curve. Now we have a positive one, but clearly rates have come down dramatically. The other white line is the corporate bond yield. It's come down significantly as well. So really what you're seeing here is uh, significantly lower yields. Why is that important? Well, if you've got governments all over the world financing deficits and they basically were paying on their five-year bonds, a year ago they were paying, let's call it one and a half percent, and now they're paying, let's call it 40 basis points. They have had a their interest costs dropped dramatically. So although debt levels are higher, much higher than they were pre-COVID, the interest rates or the cost of financing these debts. So as bonds have come down, so as governments see their bonds um, get refinanced, in other words, they come due. So a 20 year bond 20 years ago might've cost the Canadian government of Canada five or 6% as they come due and they, they go back to market and refinance a 20-year bond with a new 20-year bond, they're going to pay 1%. So debt levels are high, but the refinance rate to the cost of refinancing, refinancing or rolling, or rolling over this, this debt is significantly lower. In the U.S., much the same story. We're seeing record low 20-year, 30-year bonds, um, and the rates have come down significantly. So let's look at the stars and dogs uh, here in Canada. So what's interesting here is we saw, we talked about con consumer discretionary. That was a trade, certainly as people, uh, portions of the economy was spending money and not on travel, on leisure. BRP was one of the benefactors. We're seeing uh, gold companies bounce back thanks to oil prices. And you're gonna see oil stocks uh, come back. Um, and the two tech stalwarts here in Canada are still um, shooting the lights out with a um, return here of 125% for Shopify and 100% for Ballard. On the dog side, it's kind of a mixed bag. A lot of good, you know, widows and orphan stocks are being sold off here. Um, the trade over, you know, the pandemic trade of, of uh, food retail is off as well. 
um, senior living, obviously REITs uh, associated with um, with the older um, demographic uh, retirement homes, uh, they're sold off as well. And obviously owning office real estate right now in Canada is not, uh, the, not much fun. If we look at the US, it's more of a mixed bag. So we've got some energy names pouncing back. We've got some tech names, some retail names. So it's really a mixed bag here. Um, interesting note, uh, CarMax, car sales in the US, everyone, including me, or many people, including me, were expecting car sales to fade. They've actually done quite the opposite. Um, on the worst performing, again, we have some really good names that are, are being sold off or safe names. So utilities, um, beer companies, um, uh, interesting uh, note to hear the property and casualty uh, insurance sector in the U.S. is under uh, under duress. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag, but we can sort of see that some lower risk names are being sold off. Um, so that's really the story in, in the U.S. Energy going up. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Please let us know if you would like to see other things in the in this video. We're continuing to improve it. I'm Benoit Padikane from Exponent Investment Management. Thank you for watching.